Well, hi everyone, welcome back to Casual Watch Talk. So I'm very lucky to be joined by Mike France from Christopher Ward. We did an interview last year, very interesting went into the history of Christopher Ward. But at that time, we we're in the middle of a pandemic, so I'll definitely ask you about that, Mike. But thank you so much for joining us on the channel. My pleasure, Sam. It's good to be back. I'm glad you think you're lucky as well. <laughs> 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 yes, I mean, l last year, we were in the middle of the pandemic, we're sort of hopefully coming to the tail end of it now. At the time, you'd really restructured the way that you were operating, but it was quite successful for you. Did that continue on? Not so much restructuring, more um, just carrying on with our, uh, with our, our MO. I mean, we were fortunate, as I said to you, uh, that uh, we were allowed to continue trading as an online-only business. Um, we didn't suffer the... Um, the problems of having to close stores as so many of our uh, competitors unfortunately had to do and as a result we took the decision after i think it was um two days of closing that we'd carry on pleased to say we we ended up um trading all through the year and uh, we had a we had a, a, a you know, sales terms we had a good year the the market if you if you take some of the um the data that's been um delivered thus far the the, the luxury watch market as it's uh, portrayed uh, which is essentially, but not exclusively, the Swiss uh, the Swiss watch brands. Um, you know that was down thirty percent um, year on year for the full year, which is uh, you know, the worst uh, the worst return uh, you can imagine. Uh, we were look very lucky to be the opposite side of that, um, and plus thirty. So um, you know, during the course of the year, we we were able to have a, a you know a, what amounted to a sixty percent differential, which means that we gained share. Uh, I wish it would have been in different circumstances, frankly, because I, I wouldn't want uh, this to, uh, to happen to anybody. But, um, you know, fortunately, our model allowed us to to gain share. Now the task is to retain and grow that share again. I think at the time we spoke last year, you you released the Super Compressor watch. and The one I'm wearing just... at the moment, so, yes. That's the Super Compressor. That's the Ocean Blue. Yeah. I think just after we spoke, there was also... You added a blue bezel to it as well, which looked pretty cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Colour is certainly one of the themes that's um, running its way through the watch industry at the moment, you'll have uh, undoubtedly have noticed. And uh, so, um, you know, something as vibrant as the uh, the Ocean Blue Super Compressor being such a big line is sort of a you know, part of that trend, I think. Also released the the Chronograph, hadn't you? The C65 yeah, ah, my, still, still my favourite watch, yeah. Yeah, how did that go? You just launched it at the time. How did that go? Not bad. I mean, uh, uh, as uh, I mean, it's at a different price point, so you don't get anything like the velocity that you get out of um, a super compressor or the C60 Sapphire, which uh, came up a year, uh, around about this time last year, we launched the C60 Sapphire. Those two watches, the Sapphire and the compressor, have, um, you know, have become real favourites and bestsellers. The C65 chronograph is the best chronograph we've ever had. But of course, in the lexicon of um, and in the league table of watches, um, you know, I learned only the other day actually that uh, if you take Omega, who seem to have a lot of um, a lot of uh, chronographs, it's only ten percent of their sales. All of their chronographs combined are apparently only ten percent of their sales. So it sort of indicates the pecking order. Yeah. Yeah, I d I didn't realise that about. Omega. Mm. We we also discussed the Sapphire, the Sapphire dial watch, and then you recently released one that was. Would you call it a black version or like a smoky dial? So, yeah, the the Sapphire black. Yes, it's um, slightly different in that the the blue Sapphire um, has a polycarbonate sort of wafer that gives the crystal the colour that that vibrant sapphire colour. Um, the sapphire black uh, is a single crystal you can actually get that as you describe it accurately a smoky look within the crystal itself so it doesn't need the uh, it doesn't need the, the polycarbonate wafer beneath it so it's you know 0.6 millimeter of thickness of a sapphire dial with that coloring already in and uh, that's again that's been um, you know um, a phenomenal success uh, since it's launched people really i mean the two the two sapphires have been outstanding for us um, 
kind of attract slightly different customers because of the look. The look is slightly different. So you joined us back today because there's some new watches that are coming out as well. So I had a sneak peek and this video will be going live on the launch day, which is the 29th. So this is the new Sealander range. Yeah, the new Sealander collection. Yeah. And a really important um, step for us, I think, uh, in rounding out the collection a bit. I've described it as the missing link in our collection on our overall range. So we have high expectations. Uh, my fingers are crossed. Yeah, I think uh, with a following wind, we'll be okay. I was reading some of the specs before and, uh, well, two of the models at least are 39 millimeters. So slightly, slightly smaller than a typical, the typical rest of the line. Yeah, I mean, there's, you, you, you know, there's no question at all. I mean, Rolex is, uh, recent um, relaunch of the Rolex, uh, the Explorer 2, um, tells you the direction of uh, size in watches. Um, and, um, you know, this has been a, a trend now for some time. I mean, watches move slowly, glacier-like in some instances. But the, the general direction, as we all know, has been towards smaller diameter cases. For, a, for this specific type of watch, which you know, has a nod towards Explorer and also a nod towards, you know, um, things like the Aquaterra, which itself is a nod towards Explorer. I mean, so it's it's uh, it's in it's of that sort of build, but we hope with a very distinctive um, Christopher Ward look and feel and architecture to it. Others will decide, but um, um, that's that's what we've aimed to deliver here. But <clears throat> the the sweet spot we believe for this sort of crossover sports venture almost into dress type watch right now and for the foreseeable future is 40 mil and down um, and actually you know we we did consider going even smaller than 39 back some time ago because these things aren't developed overnight as you know now, uh, we weren't as brave to think that we would go to 36 i have to say but um, i'm interested in what rolex have done because Whatever, uh, whatever we'd like to think, there's no question that Rolex um, set a certain benchmark, and uh, the seal of approval has now been given to um, small diameter watches. It seems to me, and I think that will, over the next two to three to four years, um, see a yet another reduction in the sweet spot, particularly for this sort of arena of watch. And so it's going to be interesting. But for right now, I think 39, which is the the automatic and the GMT um, diameter, and then 40 millimeter for the elite, um, we think are absolutely spot on um, for uh, for where this watch is is positioned. What do you think? Do you, do you do you agree with that? By the way, yeah, I I do agree with it actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like that you've gone 39 millimeters. I like that the the bracelet is gone to 20 millimeters now yeah i yeah, think for yeah. the definitely for the automatic version that's got that sort of field watch sports watch aesthetic to it yeah i think that's a that's a great size yeah um, yeah i like that you've done a polar dial in that version as well or a, or a white dial it, it yeah really yeah. pops and i'm a real weirdo about having the date on a watch so i'm glad to see that the entire range has got the dates on it as well you're a datist are you yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny isn't it some people some people are and some people aren't it's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting one but we decided to put it at six o'clock on this one so we wanted a slightly different symmetry uh, which is why the the logo is at 12 with this one yeah, that date at six o'clock is definitely a trend at the moment, isn't it? A trend that I love, actually. So Zinn mm. does mm. has done something very similar, haven't they? That's right. Yeah. The GMT version, when I've I've only just received like the full high res pictures of it, but as soon as I saw it, I sort of smiled because everybody was looking towards Rolex to really bring something great out for the Explorer 2's 50th anniversary and they, they didn't really do anything. No. Whereas <laughs> your GMT watch is kind of, it, it's almost like what the Explorer 2 could have been. It's 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 not a direct homage, but it's definitely got some of the design cues. I think it looks awesome. Um, well, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and the team will be um, delighted to hear that because um, in, in a, the reaction to those people uh, like yourself or the journalists who we've, we've already shown um, the GMT2 has been astonishing. And somehow, I think you're right, I think the 
the sense of a little disappointment that Rolex didn't do something uh, has led to a sort of a um, you know a sort of a, a delight that uh, this is a this is a this is it, it clearly is a nod towards the X World Two, um, but 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 as I said, I hope. Um, it's it's not a homage in that sense. It's it, we're not trying to ape them. It's very Christopher Ward. It's got our tri it's, you know cu design cues from our Trident collection, but also interesting design cues of its own, including a brand new case design. Um, so although it architecturally follows the the pattern that we've established with um, the light catcher case, this case sits somewhere between the um, the C sixty five retro case, which has softer Fast setting and the C60 Trident case, which, which is a very contemporary tool watch um, arena. This sits, you know, intentionally somewhere in the middle, um, but it's quite, it's quite a dynamic feel to it because we think it's a, it's, a, it's a contemporary watch. Although it's, if you go back to Explorer territory, all of those design cues who's uh, born of the mid-50s. Um, but this is not a watch of the mid-50s. This is very much a watch of, um, of 2021 and beyond, we hope. But, um, yeah, so we're very excited. And it's, uh, yeah, the GMT, I think, is... Uh, although, you know, interestingly, in my, uh, I love the GMT. Uh, I'm going to say I love all of them, not I? Because uh, that's my job. Uh, but of all the three that I... Uh, that I, I I'm uh, In some ways, I'm proud of them. They've got... We'll talk about um, all three, I'm sure, but the one that um, I just absolutely love is the auto, three handed days. Because when you pair things back, quality has to be obvious. Yeah. If if you if you aren't engineering things beautifully and finishing to a high level of detail, you know, simple paired back things can look dreadful. And I think it's for me it demonstrates in some ways, the journey that we've been on over the past 15 years, that we can now produce a watch of this ill, retail it at 595 um, um, for a strap version, and it had all of the sort of engineering excellence that we've been developing over those 15 years. So I'm really, I'm proud of, uh, proudest in many ways of that watch, because I think it absolutely gets to the core of what uh, Chris Ward is about. And I uh, uh, we we did debate. You you'll be you'll be you are pleased that we we ended up with the date. Um, but we did debate long and hard about whether we would because uh, I I'm kind of a little the other way. I'm a, I'm 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 a simple man anyway. Um, but <laughs> so I'm not I'm not intelligent enough to have uh, to have uh, sophisticated taste. But genuinely, uh, I tend towards simpler um, and uh, uh, down. Not minimalist necessarily, but in that direction um uh, and this i was quite at one stage i was i was i was pushing for no date on that watch but i'm pleased that the guys uh, convinced me um, to go with the date across all of, all of the three models um because i think the symmetry that we've now created with the watch is is is, is better as a result of that but uh, yeah it's um it's these are these are these are these are beautifully engineered watches and incredible value this is not not an intentional advertisement for this watch from me but if if i was designing a watch that the automatic would be the way that i would do it because it, it scratches so many ocd things i have about watches so it, de it has the date on it you haven't lost the indice marker at the six o'clock position to sacrifice for the date the minute hand goes all the way to the outer minute track instead yeah. of you know short falling short yeah. it's it was like that world timer that I reviewed. I think I said at the time it's it the sim it looks like a simple design, but the simplicity is where the where it all comes together. So yeah, I like the automatic. The Sealander Elite is the the top of the range. How does that watch watch differ? Where was the inspiration for that? Because it it looks it's not a departure from that. If you look at the other uh, watches that you've got in the sort of dress watch category, but it's definitely mm. different than than the sort of dive watches. Yeah, I mean, it is. And um, firstly, it's titanium, so it's very light. But the, the inspiration for it um, is an interesting inspiration. I did, uh, there's a 100-mile there's a, um, bike ride in, um, uh, called Ride London, which uh, sadly um, was, um, was um, abandoned last year for reasons we all know about and has been pushed back again this year, sadly. Uh, and I, I did that ride in, um, in 2019. And... Uh, 
uh, you have to do a quite a fair bit of training to to, to be able to ride a uh, hundred miles uh, across London into Surrey up Box Hill, which is a famous uh, famous hill. In fact, we did the um, we pretty much did the um, the Olympic uh, the 2012 Olympic route you know, to, in the hundred miles. So in the training of that, I mean, I'm hardly going to be somebody who's going to wear a, um, a smartwatch or a Garmin, am I? Um, so I uh, I'm cycling. Um, with a, with one of our watches, and of course, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, and if you're a cyclist yourself, um, those who are who are listening to this will know this to be the case. Uh, the position of your hand when cycling often forces the crown of a watch to dig into them, which can become very uncomfortable. Yeah, and so during the course of my hundreds of miles of training for the, um, and literally was hundreds of miles of training for uh, for Ride London in 2019, I determined that that was not, you know, we had to find a watch that I could <laughs> I could ride comfortably with, and that led us to a retractable crown. And there are very few retractable crowns in watchmaking. We can only find another two watches at the moment. One is the um, Aquaterra Ultralight. Also titanium. Also titanium, um, which I think retails at around £40,000. Uh, yeah, a, a steal at uh, fifty thousand dollars. I think <laughs> yeah, I, I might 50, have pointed it out on the podcast before. <laughs> fifty, yeah, an absolute steal. I'm sure you've got half a dozen in the in the um, uh, And um, we wanted this to be at the the elite in this in this scenario. Is this is a sports watch? It's an elite sports watch. Coming further down the line, towards the end of the year, you'll see another um, evocation of this watch in terms of its. It's it's sporting prowess um, and it's it's usefulness in that situation. So we wanted to we wanted to work out how we could incorporate a um, a retractable crown, which makes this a very special watch. You combine that with the titanium. You combine that with the fact that it's a chronometer. You combine that with the fact that we've cut through the dial to take out weight, um, but also. To, to add a really interesting look. So if you shine a light through the back of this watch, the light comes through the front. It's a really sexy watch in lots of ways, yeah? And it will have its own titanium bracelet as well, uh, as well as the uh, strap option. So it's a very special watch, sort of pushing out those technical boundaries that we also delight in trying to do, whether it be super compressors, for instance, whether it be some of our own uh, JJ calibers or SH21. The challenges associated with the with the auto and the GMT were much more around finding the design that was right to express those watches because they're relatively straightforward watches, beautifully engineered, wide appeal, um, you know, sp- crossover sports adventure watches. With the elite. This was to live by its name, something that was at the top of that, which had to be pushed technically. Uh, if you're going to have a s- true sports watch uh, that's useful in a number of specific sporting events, then it has to be technically advanced. And so this was a technical, as much as a design challenge, it was as much a technical challenge. The guys working with the, the crown manufacturer created a, you know, a, a retractable crown that is beautifully easy to operate touch touch and it's in and out um is incredibly comfortable comfortable to work the head is you know 45 grams so it's incredibly light because of titanium we feel that this is going to be the real real winner the reaction we've had to it is so far is just astonishing from people because because as you point out and as i say you know it's the competition for a watch of this technical specification is is in the the stratosphere. Nobody's ever produced a watch of this ill at our sort of um, value. That makes it a very exciting entry, I think, into the, the world of watches. Certainly for me. <laughs> so, how does the crown work? It's not you unscrew it and it, it pops out, or no, 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 you just press it. Oh, yeah, wow. It's water. It's watertight to 150 meters. You just press it. It's a, it, the simplest way of describing it, Sam, is it's just like a um, a, a pen. It's like a. Yeah. It's no different to a pen. Um, so uh, in when it's depressed, you're you're wearing it, 
and you're using it like site, like I would have been had it been around two two years ago for Ride London, I'd have been able to wear it uh, and not have any discomfort and not have any imprints of the crown on the back of my hand, which is uh, what I had um, riding it. So it's 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 got real practical and comfort benefits, but it's a really sexy piece of kit. And as I said, there are only I think there are only two watches. Uh, other than ours that have got anything approaching this sort of uh, crown there are two i mean for those uh, i don't know if you know this but in switzerland really there are only um only really two crown manufacturers of any um, repute that you'd, uh, oh, and the know. world goes to them everybody goes to them um and we've um what well actually one is swiss the other is french yeah um, just near the border uh, and um, we're talking, these are the guys who, who produce crowns for the very top end brands. You know, we're talking very, very high end brands. And uh, that's, that's where the crown's coming from. And we, we've gone with the, the French manufacturer because they were able to uh, work, uh, work out with us how we incorporated best into this particular design. And so it's a, it's a stunning piece of technical expertise but it has a real value for the for the for the wearer i mean it's got a, it's not just it's not just showing off for showing off sake it's got a real benefit in wear and as i say the inspiration came from nothing more exciting than me riding a bike i know when we spoke last you had a few models that you'd been using a, an in-house or a christopher ward designed movement and i know the industries they were it sort of went that direction in 2020 and then noticing sort of at watches and wonders there wasn't so much talk about in-house movements but had, was there a thought of putting a, an in-house caliber in these new watches i, I see you've stuck with salita which i know served you very well over the years the, at launch no um i can see uh, and we're all you know we're all already talking about uh, will there be uh, a Sealander SH21 at some point? Well, subject to this launch going the way we hope it does go, you know, um, the customers will tell us, uh, give us the answer to that fairly shortly. If it's if it's as successful as we hope it's going to be, then there will almost certainly at some point be a Sealander SH21 without without question, um, but not within too short a period of launch probably we're talking 22 23 before we before we go here the last time we'd spoke it was in the early stages of the i know it was only a year ago but it was the the british clock and watchmakers association i'm really interested to know how that went because i think at the time nicholas at fears had just joined that's right yeah yeah well nick nick, nick was uh, one of the founders um um so when roger and i um roger smith and i decided to uh to start this uh, idea off, uh, we constructed a, um, a small board of five, of which Nicholas was one of the founding board members. Um, to be honest, it's been the reaction has been way beyond our expectation. Um, as of yesterday, we signed up our sixtieth trade member, I think, um, or about so. So, you know, who knew um, when we started? thinking and talking about this, Roger and I, um, you know, two or three years ago, we knew that there were going to be 60 plus watch brands um, incorporated in the British Isles. And uh, so it, it's, it's, the response has been fantastic. It's still early days. Um, we're still working out how best we encourage this sector in the future. But what's been demonstrated by the people who've joined already is the hunger that exists for a light to be shined on this sector. And so, you know, and our, our role, as I probably said last time we spoke, um, our, the purpose of the Alliance, our role in the Alliance is, is primarily to, sh you know, to allow some sunshine onto what is a, an incredible sector that's a, a renaissance in British watchmaking of all different types, uh, and if you if you put you know if you allow sunshine in, things tend to grow, don't they? And so that's the that's what's happening here. There's a there's a, there's a light being shone on a sector that previously didn't even know it existed. This growth and interest in in this wonderful watchmaking sector in the, in, in in the British Isles, and uh, it is time.
as they say. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. The watches are live now on the website, so go and check them out, guys. I really appreciate it, Mike. Thanks. As always, a pleasure, Sam. Thank you.